Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, so it's nice to, uh, to be at this meeting. It's my first time uh, at this workshop. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Virginia working in the Laboratory for Engineering Safe Software. And uh, as was just alluded to, uh, I think uh, there are people from different communities here. I come from a software engineering background. So um, while I'm, uh, let's say, aware of a lot of machine learning and AI work and actually have studied it quite a bit, uh, I'm definitely not an expert, so uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So my goal today is simply to explain to you this title, Distribution Aware Black Box Test Adequacy for Neural Networks. And I'm going to start by uh, letting you know that the, the work is being done, led by uh, Swarupa Dola, who's a PhD student um, at our university, who's co-supervised by myself and my colleague, Mary Lou Sofa. So I wanna start with a little bit of background on traditional software uh, and how we test it and how we think about testing uh, such systems. So let's imagine we have the system that's shown on the left. It has six components. These have all been programmed by humans using traditional programming languages. and the Edges are meant to depict the data and control flow amongst these components. And collectively, they orchestrate a computation that uh, takes two inputs and computes two outputs. Generally, when we think about these kinds of systems, uh, we think that their development, uh, their development is driven by a set of requirements. And these requirements are oftentimes specified informally. Uh, but what they capture is the expectation of the output for a given input. Uh, typically, these descriptions are given at the software interface, whether it's the user interface or the component or module interface. When you have these requirements descriptions, uh, it's very common to uh, formalize them or formalize aspects of these requirements, writing them down as a kind of a specification. Um, this can happen in a lot of using a lot of different formalisms, but I'll just uh, sketch something at a high level here. So we think in terms of preconditions, which are constraints that must hold on uh, inputs of the system, uh, denoted phi here, and then associated post conditions denoted, denoted as phi prime on uh, the outputs of the system. And the idea is that the pre and post conditions are paired with each other. So when the precondition holds, the post condition is supposed to subsequently hold when the outputs are produced. And you can write a lot of different specifications like this. These are, these are sort of nonsensical specifications just to illustrate the idea for you. So the first one simply says that, you know, when input one is uh, greater than zero, uh, then the first output is non-negative and the second output is positive. And the third one says something maybe a little bit more interesting. Uh, and that is that when the first input is greater than two and the second input is less than 18, then the, uh, the first output is a function of both inputs. I haven't told you what F is. And the second output is a function, a different function of the second uh, input. And so these are what requirement specifications look like. And when we have requirement specifications, we use, we give them to developers and they go off and implement these components. So another thing about traditional software is that its behavior is encoded as a mixture of what I'll call control and data. And if we zoom in on one of these components, we can talk a little bit more about that. So I have uh, some code here with a bunch of conditional statements. These conditional statements are sort of cascaded in some sense and nested. And when you uh, take a particular input for this component, which of course is based on the data state of the program, the state of the parameters and whatever globals uh, are uh, in scope, what that gives rise to is a sequence of branch outcomes. And uh, we oftentimes refer to that as a program execution path or, or, or uh, using some other terminology. Um, but the idea is that this branching sequence defines the set of uh, the set and the ordering of statements that'll be executed associated with a particular input. And so this this interplay between the data and the control that's encoded in the software that gives rise to the behavior of the system. So for these kinds of system, what's a test? A test is uh, consists of two parts, a test input and what we call a test oracle. And so a test input is nothing more than giving you a pair of values, say, for the two inputs of the system. 
And then uh, a test oracle is going to be the obligation that the system has uh, to produce outputs that satisfy a, the predicate that's uh, you know, uh, one of the consequence of those uh, requirements that I showed you. So the idea here is that for a given test input, what you'll do is you'll kind of match up the preconditions, find the ones that are true, and then the post associated post conditions will define the oracle. So the oracle is chosen uh, for the test input. So that's kind of mechanically what a test is. And of course, we usually deal with test suites or sets of these tests. But what's the high level goal of testing? The way I think about it is that there's kind of two aspects to it. The first is that we're interested in evidence that the system meets its requirements. Uh, and the second is that we're interested in evidence that the system is free of faults. And these are not necessarily the same thing. And I'm gonna to try to illustrate that for you in a second here. So let's think about the first one and think about these little requirements that we have. What I could do is analyze all of the preconditions for these requirements and I could carefully select a set of test inputs that would cover in some sense the preconditions. In other words, make them true and false in various ways. If I did that, what I get are these five tests right here. And so in this sense, I could take my requirements and produce, um, let's say reasonably thorough uh, evidence that, uh, that I've covered the behavior in these requirements uh, and, uh, and provide that evidence to whoever the stakeholders are that are making, for example, deployment decisions about the system. But it's not exactly the same as evidence that the system is free of faults. So let's take that little test suite consisting of five inputs uh, and let's compute the code coverage. And the way that we do that is that we simply run the program and when we run the program, we add some instrumentation to the execution that allows us to track which statements or branches or, or what have you were executed by that test. And I'm depicting that here in green for you. And then every time I run a test, I'm gonna show you the new statements that have been covered. So basically this is the cumulative coverage across the test suite. I keep on running tests. I get to the end of my test uh, suite and I have mostly green but not completely green. If I look at the lower right-hand component and zoom in on that, you can see this, this last statement, which now I've shifted into red, that was not executed by any test in the test suite. And so this is a kind of a red flag. It would indicate to you that um, if you deploy the system, you don't really have any evidence about whether, uh, how this last statement, if it's executed during deployment, will behave. And so uh, there's the risk that this, uh, there's latent faults uh, kind of harboring in this, uh, in this statement. So what this gives rise to is sort of the overarching question of how much testing is enough? How much testing is enough to give you confidence that the requirements are met? How much testing is enough to give you confidence that, that the system is, is free of faults? And thinking about uh, uh, this question, um, Researchers have been studying this, this topic for many decades uh, under the sort of umbrella of what's called test adequacy. So is the testing process, uh, you know, meet the, does it meet the objectives of uh, providing the appropriate kinds of evidence? And there's really two frameworks for this. The first is called black box adequacy, and the second is white box adequacy. And black box adequacy focuses on the test input space, uh, the system input space. So generally speaking, for real systems, the input space is way too big to cover exhaustively. And so what's done is you perform a kind of abstraction on, the, on that space. And oftentimes that abstraction process is driven by the structure of the requirement specifications. So I'll give you a little, that, that's exactly what I did in that little example I just showed you. But let me show you a different example. So you can think of um, you know, using domain specific information. For example, if I have an age input or an income in input, I might, I, I might define some kind of equivalence partition on these uh, domains. So for age, I might say I'm interested in distinguishing infants from children, from adolescents, from adults, from elderly people. And that would give rise to these intervals here. Maybe infinity is a little bit too high on the upper bound there, but. OK, so that's the idea. Black box focuses on the input space, and you have to have some kind of abstraction of that input space to be uh, effective in, in recording the progress of testing relative to that, uh, that space. White box is pretty much what I just showed you. It focuses not on the input space, but instead on the implementation structure and asks for a test suite 
well, how thoroughly have you covered that structure? And there's many different approaches that have been developed in the literature here. Some of them focus uh, ex exclusively on control, like the statements or the branches that are execute, executed. A uh, little bit less common for techniques to focus on data, but many researchers have explored that as well. So we just saw an example of this. Uh, we had a little example with, that had 60 statements. We had a test suite consisting of five test inputs, and those collectively covered 57 of those 60 statements. So we would say this is a 95% statement adequate test suite. Now you, as the test engineer, have to make a couple of decisions. You have to decide, first off, what adequacy criterion do you want? Are you interested in statements or branches or something stronger than that? Um, and then the second thing you have to decide on is how, uh, what percentage of that adequacy criterion do you, do you need to meet before you can make a, a, you know, a confident deployment decision, right? And uh, real systems go through, you know, every um, software system that's been, ever been deployed, people have gone through this kind of calculus of how much testing is enough and how are we gonna get the evidence that supports decisions related to that. So we've been talking about traditional software systems. And what I really wanna focus on today is what happens when we replace a traditional software system with a, a system that's uh, trained by machine learning. And I realize that machine learning is just one aspect of uh, AI technology, but it's one that's kind of um, gaining a lot of momentum and we're seeing a lot of industrial partners um, who want to deploy it in certain settings. And they're going to um, have, uh, I would say, the exact same testing goals. They want evidence that the system meets its requirements and they want evidence that the system is free of faults. Yet the structure of these systems and the way that they are developed is very, very different than traditional software. You know, what I'm showing you here is a little uh, three block ResNet architecture that takes uh, grayscale images and computes a steering angle and a probability of collision from that. These are quite complicated models. And like I said, they have a very different structure than what I just showed you. So some of the challenges here are related to the fact that if we think about black box adequacy, well, these systems are data driven and they're not really requirements driven. And as I argued, I think black box adequacy is somehow related to a, a requirements analysis uh, and we don't have those. So what are we gonna do about that? That's gonna be the main topic that I talk about today. The second one is also quite interesting, and that is when you think about white box adequacy, I kind of emphasize the importance of control, but control information is not really present in these systems. Uh, except for sort of very esoteric architectures, it's generally the case that for every input that's fed to one of these uh, neural networks, uh, every neuron is going to compute an output. So it's not the case that for certain inputs, this one, one layer is activated and another one is not activated. Um, we don't make those kinds of conditional decisions when, it, when uh, running inference. And so you know, that, that presents some challenges for tra to traditional notions of test coverage. Now, fortunately, researchers uh, understood this and for the last uh, three years or so have been exploring test adequacy criteria for neural networks, in particular, white box adequacy criteria. And I'm going to try to give you a sense of how those work. So a lot of these uh, criteria have focused on uh, sort of the basic building block of a neural network, specifically a neuron, and they've also focused on ones that use ReLU activation functions. So everyone's probably familiar with this function. I won't belabor the point. Uh, but the first uh, coverage criteria that was developed is what's called neuron coverage. And it simply asks the question, what percentage of neurons were active in some run, test run? Now, active, as you know, uh, means that the, uh, the neuron is in its phase where it has this linear behavior. So the pre-activation value is uh, non-negative and inactive is you know, the negative values. So this, this is simply a, a, a ratio where you look uh, across each test run, you record the number of active neurons or the set of active neurons, you keep accumulating that, and then it's the size of that set divided by the total number of neurons uh, in, the, uh, in the network, and that gives you neuron coverage. People, people have, uh, uh, once that was introduced, people said, oh, well, maybe there's other variants of this, this notion that could be useful. And so there's a set of criterion that were developed based on the idea of a neuron's active range. 
The idea here is that you run training, you record the, pre, the minimum and maximum pre-activation value for every neuron, and you get this interval LU. And then you can produce uh, coverage criteria that, that are variants uh, of this, or that exploit this information. So the first one that I'll talk about is what's called K-multi-section neuron coverage. And it simply says, I want to take this range LU and break it up into K equally sized subintervals. And then I'm gonna record the percentage of neuron range intervals hit by some test run. So this is a finer criterion. Uh, and uh, depending on your value, you know, value of K, it's a much larger coverage domain. So K times the number of neurons. Now, uh, this focus is on uh, covering the active range. And so what some people said is, well, what, what if we focus on the inactive range? In other words, um, can we test or can we determine whether a test suite explores extremal values um, relative to what was observed during training? And they identify this lower boundary range and this upper boundary range. And this uh, criterion, neuron boundary coverage, asks whether the, uh, for the percentage of neuron boundary range intervals hit by some test run, okay? And then there's another one that just focuses on the upper range, that's called strong neuron activation coverage. So again, researchers have been thinking about this problem, trying to customize white box criteria to the behavior of, of, of neural networks, and, uh, and this is what they've come up with. Now in the title, I say distribution aware. And so uh, in order to explain what that means, I first have to tell you what a distribution is all about. And this is related to uh, what's referred to as the manifold hypothesis. And that is that uh, real world high dimensional data lie on low dimensional manifolds embedded within a high dimensional space. So if you think about that example I showed you earlier where we have a a forward facing camera in a vehicle and it takes 200 by 200 grayscale images. That's a 40,000 dimensional space. What this hypothesis says is the actual data that will ever be observed during deployment can actually be represented in a much lower dimension than 40,000. And I like to illustrate this uh, using what's called the Swiss roll data set. So on the left hand side, what you see is a three dimensional space. Uh, sometimes refer, these are sometimes referred to generally as the ambient space. Uh, and you can see a bunch of data points there. These are these colored points and they're, and they're arranged in this spiral shape. Uh, it's called the Swiss roll data set because that shape corresponds to the look of a particular kind of cake. Uh, so you'll notice a couple things about that image on the left. Uh, first, most of that volume is not used, that 3D volume, only a very small portion of that volume consists of uh, data points. Uh, and the second thing you'll see is that this spiral structure allows you to kind of unroll that data and embed it in a two-dimensional space, which is shown on the right. Now, the nice thing about that uh, that embedding, that two-dimensional embedding, is that if you, you could just focus on that rectangular region uh, that seems to circumscribe the, uh, uh, the data points, and you would have a very dense, uh, you know, structure that would allow you to manipulate the data. So you, you wouldn't have to worry about, uh, you know, missing data, uh, and you wouldn't have to worry about points within that rectangle that didn't correspond to data. And so this is the main idea that the, the data, you, you shouldn't be thinking in terms of the input domain, you should be thinking rather in terms of where the data lie and uh, modeling that. Speaking of that, the machine learning community has studied this problem extensively. It's a very active area trying to develop models of the data distribution. And they put them to work for two different purposes, uh, at least two different purposes. The first is to determine whether inputs lie on the data distribution uh, for which a model is trained. Uh, and the second is for what are called generative models. The, these models allow you to produce new previously unseen instances of a data distribution. Uh, and you know, you're all from, you've all seen methods like uh, GANs and uh, and the like. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the model called a variational autoencoder in a second. The first thing I wanna illustrate for you is what is an out of distribution detector? And so the top row here is uh, just a set of MNIST digits and any well-trained uh, out of distribution detector for this data set would be able to say that uh, 
all of these uh, inputs are in the distribution. Now I know MNIST is a simple distribution, but these methods work for much more complicated distributions. The second row is a set of inputs generated by a test method called deep concolic. And you can see if you squint that there are things that look like uh, digits in there, but there's a lot of other visual artifacts. And any again, any well-trained out of distribution detector would say that is out of the distribution. Similarly for the bottom row, which were inputs generated by yet another test tech, testing technique. So a VAE, a variational autoencoder, uh, they were developed to do variational inference, but a lot of people think about them uh, as variants of autoencoders, which kind of technically they're not. But if you know what an autoencoder is, you know that it's a, it's a network that's trained to uh, on, on a certain class of inputs to be able to accurately recover those inputs. So that's kind of depicted here. So X is the input. Uh, X is passed through what's called an encoder network to produce a latent representation that is then passed to a decoder network to produce uh, a, a, an approximation of X. And, and the loss function tries to get X hat to be close to X. But what's really going on in these networks is that the latent representation is actually a distribution. And so E of X actually is computing uh, the parameters of a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And then what you do is you sample from that distribution, take that sample, run it through the decoder, and you get a sample, I mean, you get a parameters of a distribution in the output space, and then you sample from that and you get X hat. Now there's other things, a lot of really interesting uh, things about VAEs, and one of the interesting properties is that this latent um, representation is act uh, actually trained to, to, so that it uh, matches a a spherical standard normal distribution. So there's a term in the loss function that tries to drive that distribution to be uh, normal. Okay, so now I wanna ask the question, to what extent have existing test adequacy uh, criteria, like the ones I showed you before, to what extent are they distribution aware? And if they're not, what are the consequences of that? We explored this in a paper at the International Conference on Software Engineering last year. We actually explored multiple aspects of this question, uh, but I'm just gonna explain to you the coverage story here. So we ran an experiment that works as follows. We took three state-of-the-art uh, neural network test generation techniques. They're shown here, Deep Explore, DL Fuzz, and Deep Concolic. They use very different algorithmic approaches. And we generated a bunch of tests for a bunch of different models. And then we looked at those tests and, uh, and we, we took those tests and we recorded the coverage that was accumulated by um, all the different um, coverage criteria that I showed you earlier. And then we tried to separate uh, the coverage that was achieved for the test inputs that were on the distribution or were valid relative to the distribution versus those that were off the distribution. We used a particular means for calculating uh, this uh, on distribution, off distribution test. So here's what the data show. You don't have to scan all of this. I just want you to see that across two data sets and across eight neural network models in these three testing techniques, we ran a bunch of experiments. And sort of the high level point is that the bulk of the neuron coverage is for out of distribution inputs. And you may be saying, well, I'm not really that surprised. That was a pretty coarse cr uh, coverage criteria, just, just recording whether neurons were active or not. But if we look at all these other criteria that have been developed, we see a similar trend. Most of the, uh, most of the coverage that was accumulated uh, was for invalid inputs, okay? So the, what's, the, what's the problem here? The problem is that if you're using white box coverage criteria and you're recording uh, coverage information for inputs that are off the distribution, that could be potentially wasteful because typically when you, uh, coverage information is used to drive ge the generation of new tests. And so there's this incentive to try to, to drive testing to be off the distribution. And if you do that, well, it's not reflecting deployment data. The second is it could simply be misleading. You could get higher numbers uh, because you've tested way off the distribution and you have a false sense of the thoroughness of testing relative to your deployment context. Finally, we did it in an experimental setting um, and it was a little bit expensive, uh, 
But if you wanted to post facto factor out any coverage that was accumulated by off distribution inputs, that would be kind of uh, diff difficult to do. So another observation that we made, and others have made this as well, is that these white box criteria that I've shown you, on the one hand, they're too sensitive, right? So, uh, you know, they um, neuron coverage is essentially going to saturate very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, and what this means when a when a metric like this saturates is that you can feed it almost any tests and it will max out uh, the the coverage value. And then there's there's no room left in the criterion to detect new forms of tests. Um, and, uh, and so that's problematic. So this leads to the work uh, that we've been doing recently on distribution aware black box test adequacy um, for neural networks. So uh, like I mentioned, earlier, black box uh, adequacy criteria focus on the input space. And that's precisely what we do when we define this input distribution coverage. So this is a framework I'll be explaining in the next couple minutes. And at a very high level, what it does is it takes test input vectors. And the first thing it does is it filters out uh, input vectors that you shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't be uh, counting towards your coverage. So things like out of distribution uh, data is, uh, is sort of a filtered. But the key idea of input distribution coverage is that we perform this step called feature abstraction, which converts test input vectors into feasible feature vectors. Once we have this set of feature vectors for your test set, we apply existing combinatorial interaction coverage metrics to compute uh, a ratio that we report out to you as the IDC coverage. So I'll be explaining uh, the elements of this story uh, not, in, not in a ton of detail, but I want to try to give you the sense of how, how this works. The first question to ask is, well, what's a feature? So as we talked about earlier in traditional testing, we pretty much relied on the requirements uh, or domain knowledge to give us some kind of um, abstraction of the input space. So if we had age, remember we, we talked about infant, child, adolescent, adult, and elderly. Um, but the problem is for neural networks, we don't really have a requirements specification. You may have some very high level uh, English sentence uh, that describes it, but boiling that down to a more formal uh, requirement spec, that's not something that's easily done. What we do have is data. And so the approach we take is to use the data set to learn what we call a feature model. So I'm using the word feature here, but in the machine learning community, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about generative factors. And in fact, that's our observation is that generative factors can be thought of as features. What, what, uh, how, how are we going to uh, you know, encode these features? Well, we're gonna leverage this latent representation that's computed by a variational autoencoder. And recall that I mentioned that there's a term in the loss function that drives the training of the network such that this uh, latent representation matches this multivariate standard normal. So let me try to illustrate for you uh, how this, what, what this looks like. Uh, it's very difficult to, to think about six dimensional <laughs> uh, spaces. And so what I'm doing here is showing you um, a, a small fragment of the latent space of uh, a trained VAE on a, a data set called the DSprites data set. And this middle column is, a, is the repeated image for a given coordinate in that space. So it's a six dimensional space. So there's six components to the coordinate. It's a, it's a sort of a normally sized oval uh, centered in the frame. And then what I do in each of these rows is uh, for each, each row corresponds to a dimension in the latent space. And what I do say in the first row, I'm going to take the coordinate, uh, the the um, component of the of the coordinate that corresponds to the first dimension. I'm going to decrement it a little bit, moving to the left, and increment it a little bit, moving to the right. And I'm going to keep all the other ones fixed. And then I'll do the same thing for all the other dimensions. And so, if you look at these uh, at, at this uh, this um, small neighborhood uh, in the latent space, what you can observe is that the first row seems to correspond to translation in the X coordinate and the second translation in the Y coordinate. Um, the third one is some kind of scaling and the fourth is rotation and the fifth is shape. Uh, 
this uh, this bottom row seems to be very stable uh, as you move through uh, that uh, if you sweep that dimension back and forth, and so um, so that one is uh, something that we'll discuss in a, in a minute. Now, what I've shown you here is uh, a, pr a pretty simplistic and idealized picture, but the methods that I'm talking about do not require that we're able to map input data to uh, a latent representation that is somehow humanly understandable. All it requires is that there exists a mapping from the, uh, the, the training data to, uh, to um, a latent space that uh, where each dimension corresponds to some uh, combination of the uh, of the features or generative factors, and that's precisely what uh, the encoder stage of a VAE is supposed to do. So this is a kind of a busy picture, but this is the overarching framework for uh, IDC, and I'm going to walk through it in a couple of steps. Uh, so we have this filtration step. I've already talked about filtering out out of distribution data. But we have another filtration step as well that we uh, that uses a parameter that we call target density. And the way you think about target density is that in this latent representation, each of the dimensions in the latent space is distributed normally. And what that's going to give rise to is, of course, a multivariate distribution. But what you want to do is uh, is cut off the tails of that distribution. And how much of the tails you want to cut off? Well, that's something that's application specific. And you as the test engineer would, you know, turn this knob um, saying, for example, if I, I want to do some basic testing, so maybe I want a probability density of 0.9, or I want I have a critical system, so I want 0 0.9999999, you know, at seven nines or something like that. And that's going to shift where that uh, where you're trimming the, the tails of the distribution off. Now, once you select a target density, what that actually does in high dimension is uh, gives rise to this, uh, this shell structure uh, kind of depicted on the right here. I'm only showing it in three dimensions because I can't draw pictures in higher dimension. Um, but um, if, you, if you fix this target density, then what we can define is an inner radius and an outer radius of the shell. Uh, and uh, the way that that's done, it's based on the, uh, this theorem called the Gaussian annulus theorem. And essentially there's a unique thinnest k-dimensional shell uh, that, that holds uh, that target density. And from that, we can compute the inner and outer radius. So this is what we call the target density shell. And that's actually the coverage domain. That's what we wanna cover with IDC. So uh, once we have filtered out inputs that lie off the distribution and outside of that, target shell, whether they lie outside or inside the inner radius, we throw them away. Uh, any remaining input, what we're going to do is uh, encode them into the latent space. And then there's two steps to this process. We're going to do a little bit more analysis of that latent vector. And then any, uh, any uh, latent uh, dimensions that survive that uh, analysis, we're going to partition them. And I'm going to explain that to you next. So what we saw in this picture here was that the first five rows seemed meaningful to us. And if you actually can, can, uh, compute the KL divergence of these rows on the training data relative to the assumed uh, standard normal prior, what you see is you got pretty high values. This last value is very close to zero. And uh, so we establish a threshold on this KL divergence and we say that these final dimensions are noise dimensions and we ignore them. So we're taking the six dimensional latent space and trimming it down to five uh, information bearing dimensions. And that's what we work with. The non-noise dimensions are then partitioned. So we partition again to produce a finite um, coverage domain. And the way you can think about it is that we're just breaking up the, uh, the uh, dimensions into intervals. Uh, and then combinations of those intervals across the dimensions actually give rise to uh, a hyper rectangle, uh, the, like the one depicted on the right hand side here. Now, the question is, how should you break up these intervals? And there's uh, in each dimension, the, the answer is there's a lot of different strategies. But one strategy that we've explored is what we call this equal density partition. And you can compute um, this equal density partition uh, script P here. Uh, using the quantile function. So pretty efficient to compute this. 
So that'll give us a set of feasible feature vectors where the components of those feature vectors are partitions of the dimensions corresponding to the non-noise latent dimensions. Now we got to compute. Now we have to compute a coverage measure, and we're going to do that using off-the-shelf co uh, combinatorial coverage metrics that will compute the numerator of the uh, of the of the ratio. So what I'm depicting here on the right is something called the uh, total t-tuples. Um, I'll explain a little bit more of that in a minute. But we need to compute the denominator as well, and that's actually non-trivial for this problem, and I'll explain why in a second. So you might be thinking, this is not so bad. You know, I got K non-noise dimensions, each partitioned, you know, according to the script P, so P-way partitioning. And so that gives me size of P to the K combinations. Well, the problem is if I have a big dimension or a fine partition, uh, that quickly grows to be way too large. In traditional software testing, we see this as well. We have combinatorial um, testing problems for traditional software. And what people have developed is what's called a co combinatorial interaction testing to address the you know, uh, ex explosive scale of this problem. And the way it works is that you choose a parameter T called the combinatorial test st strength, and then you can systematically cover a T-sized combinatorial subspace out of the full space uh, that you want to cover. So here, what 100% coverage means is uh, all combinations of T out of K features are present. So if T is two, what you're saying is I want all pairs of partition combinations across all features, or in our case, dimensions. So that's all well and good. Uh, that, that might allow us to compute the numerator. Um, but the denominator is tricky because uh, CIT often assumes that these features are independent, but in our problem, they are not independent because it's, it's perfectly possible that you could choose a, a target density and a partitioning of these dimensions such that the hyper rectangles lie either completely outside of the outer radius or completely inside the inner radius. And we call those infeasible partition combinations. And we do not want to include those in the denominator because if we did, we would over inflate uh, the metric. You'd never be able to get to 100%. So with normal CIT, you compute something like the number of covered t-tuples across your test suite, and then you just divide by p to the t. Um, the problem I'm exposing here is that the com uh, computation of the denominator is much more tricky. Uh, it could potentially be uh, explo you know, very expensive to compute, but we have methods that exploit symmetries and then um, use reasonably clever encodings to solve nonlinear constraints with SMT solvers. So what I've explained to you is this framework that has a number of different components, uh, is parameterized in a number of different ways. And what I want to do in the next just couple of minutes is give you a brief sense of how it performs across the space of parameters uh, that we could choose here. I'm not going to show you all the uh, experimental studies that we've done, but I want to give you a sense of the breadth of the study. So we looked at um, four different data sets, and for each of those, we have multiple VAEs. And those VAEs are kind of selected using a, a kind of a fractional factorial design approach. So we have a set of objectives, uh, a set of architectures, and a set of latent sizes, and we combine those in different ways. Um, and we're using very modern um, VAE architectures like beta total correlation VAE or the, the two-stage VAEs that have been developed in the last couple of years. So uh, I'm going to talk about two questions. The first is, how well does IDC reflect feature variation in a test suite? Um, this is sort of the goal of requirements-driven testing. We want to cover uh, you know, the span, if you will, of the input domain. Uh, we, we explored this using the DSprites data set, the one I've shown you before that has these five uh, features. And we, did, we selected that one because we can directly manipulate the diversity in test suites. So we can generate um, different test suites that have full feature diversity, or we can choose to restrict diversity, and we can control that in a specific way. So we selected a categorical and a non-categorical feature or generative factor for this problem, and we restricted diversity relative to those. We, when, in doing this, we were careful to keep test size fixed because we know that impacts uh, coverage. And so uh, here's a plot that kind of depicts uh, the results that we observed. Um, and uh, I'll go through it quickly. I know it's a little busy, 
uh, across the x-axis are three different VAE configurations. The y-axis reports three-way coverage, so that's T equals three. Uh, and each of the, for each of the VAE configurations, we have three stacked plots. The leftmost one is full feature diversity. The second one, or middle one, uh, restricts the diversity of the shapes data. And the third restricts the diversity of the scale data. Now, the restrictions on shape and scale are slightly different. And just to help you view what's going on, I'll just highlight these uh, bars. Um, and so these bars should be compared with the, uh, the, the bar on the left, uh, le the leftmost bar. And what you can observe very clearly is that when we restrict the diversity of a test set, IDC is sensitive to that. It can detect that. Okay, so IDC is able to detect feature variation uh, in a test suite. And we've, we've, been, we've been able to show this across a, a number of different treatments, uh, and not just for this uh, CIT metric, but another metric as well. So the last question I want to talk about before I wrap up is, how does IDC compare with existing um, metrics, uh, in particular the white box metrics we studied, we looked at before? So here we use nine different DNN test generation approaches that all are very different. They produce very different kinds of inputs. Moreover, we bootstrap testing by taking the uh, you know uh, delivered test uh, set uh, with uh, say something like Fashion MNIST. You know, it comes with the training data and test data that's used for judging test adequacy. So we use that test adequacy data set to start with, and then we added to it a thousand tests generated by you know, technique one, and then another thousand by technique two, and we added those in sequence. So our tests got stronger and stronger and stronger across the sequence. Um, we ran these tests on models trained on three different data sets, and we measured IDC coverage and six different white box coverage techniques. And here's what the data look like. The black dots are IDC, and uh, the other, uh, the, on the left-hand panel, I'm just showing you one of the uh, sweeps of data here for time. But uh, if you focus on the left panel, what you see is those white triangles, that, that's neuron coverage. And you can see that there are a number of test generation techniques for which neuron coverage can't detect anything. There are some like DT scale where it could actually detect a difference uh, relative to the previous uh, you know, increment of testing. But for IDC, uh, it's generally superior uh, to neuron coverage, and it always seems to be able to detect something new. The black dots are repeated across the two uh, images to the right. Uh, in the middle image, what I'm showing you are those finer uh, coverage criteria, like K multi-section, et cetera. And on the right, I'm showing you a different kind of uh, white box coverage uh, criteria called strong uh, or surprise adequacy. Now for the middle and right, there are uh, test generation techniques where these other metrics are superior uh, in terms of sensitivity to IDC, but generally speaking, IDC uh, outperforms these other techniques. And we saw that across a number of VAE configurations and across this uh, a diverse set of test generation techniques. Um, all right, so in summary, uh, neural network test methods, we argue, should be distribution aware. They need to be if what you want to be able to do is systematically measure variation in test inputs. And our idea is that we want to learn uh, a generative model or a, a VAE uh, model that captures the data distribution and then exploit it as effectively the definition of the feature space. Um, black box adequacy techniques like this uh, seem to be an effective complement and in many cases improve on existing white box techniques. So perhaps we're starting to get to the point where when you go to test a neural network for a critical deployment, you want to employ both white and black box testing approaches. This is traditional, this is used in traditional software. So maybe we're getting, maybe we're making a step towards that for, for neural networks. One teaser I'll give you for future work is that this IDC framework pretty much just exploits the encoder of the VAE. It does not exploit the decoder, but in ongoing work, we're using the uh, decoder uh, to support test generation. And what we'll be able to do is generate uh, a minimal test suite that guarantees a given level of coverage. So you pick the target density, you pick the combinatorial strength T, 
you pick the partitioning scheme and it will generate a test suite that guarantees coverage of that space. So with that, I just want to say thank you to our sponsors, the National Science Foundation in the US and uh, Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Laboratories. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Oh, I, sorry, I should have been monitoring the chat. I should have used my, uh, my instructor mode here. Let me see if I can pull up the chat. Uh, okay, so um, Bertrand asks, why can't we have requirement specs for NNs? Um, I think they're, oh, okay. So Ramesh has an answer. <laughs> that would have been my answer. But I think another interesting answer uh, is, um, is that uh, I think it's possible that, that we can develop specifications for neural networks when you think of them as components of a bigger system. So think back to that picture I showed you at the beginning where I have those six different components and uh, that were programmed, let's say. And imagine that I just had one of those boxes and I wanted to pull it out, pull the code out and replace it with a trained neural network. So now what, what I have is I have the same system level requirements, right? Uh, but what I wanna be able to do is take those system level requirements and map them down to the interface of that neural network, essentially asking the question, what are the requirements of the neural network relative to the rest of the system in order to meet the system level uh, specifications? So in that sense, we could potentially get some kind of requirements for, uh, for a, um, you know, a component that was embedded in the context of a bigger system. Uh, I think that's actually quite an interesting research direction. Uh, uh, okay, probably we have room for one question more, and then we will take a short break, I think. Okay, so uh, Jing Yu has a, has a question. So um, operational profile testing. I think there's a, there's a relationship, but the problem is there's, uh, with, with operational testing, um, I guess if you, if you have your, um, uh, you, you just have to be satisfied with a, um, uh, uh, the sampling strategy that you use to kind of cover that distribution, um, and you won't get uh, you won't get the same kind of uh, well. Well, it'll be difficult for you to establish what that criterion is. I guess you know, for example, if you if you said that your target density was you know um, you know seven nines or something like that, you may have to run a lot of samples uh, to be able to get close to that. Um, and we can define a coverage domain that handles, uh, that, that covers, you know, seven nines, uh, and then control the cost by uh, this partitioning uh, and by the T-way strength. So um, I agree that you, uh, that that is kind of a baseline that uh, uh, we're comparing to, especially on the test generation side. Um, but the sample complexity as you get to very uh, high densities becomes challenging. Any other questions? Oh, I guess that was the last question. Uh, yeah, sorry, but we need to we need to move for, forward. Sure, so yeah. thank you very much, Matthew, for, for the interesting uh, talk. I think that we're gonna take a, a short break Let's meet again at uh, two five. Yeah, let's meet at two five. And we will start with the uh, special session number one, uh, Encore. I think that Lucas Cordero, Cordero is here. So uh, we will start to prepare that session in the meantime. So let's meet at two oh five. Thank you.